Yeah, I mean, thanks to everybody for joining. The uh, I, I guess I started life as a foreign policy practitioner in Washington, and that that matters actually for you know the arc of the book. So uh, because of where I worked uh, in the Pentagon, I was socialized into viewing U.S. power in the kind of conventional liberal primacist liberal hegemonic way. Uh, we didn't just believe that U.S. power was like a mythical source of global stability and Asian security. We took it for granted that that was the case. Like it was dogma. It was beyond question in a certain sense. You know, Joe Nye called us Asia's oxygen. John Mearsheimer called us Asia's pacifier. Right. So I'm drinking in all those those um, self images while I'm working in Obama's Pentagon during the day. And I'm doing my PhD at night and I get exposed as part of that uh, to a research literature devoted to this empirical puzzle called the East Asian peace. And all these scholars, they're, they're analyzing the international relations of Asia. They're, they're, they're explaining Asian security. Almost none of them were talking about US power. I mean, not nobody like Robert Ross, there was like one or two, but the weight of Asian peace research was just overwhelmingly airbrushing out the United States. And Washington's view of Asian stability overwhelmingly was airbrushing out everything that wasn't the United States. Okay. So there was a clear gap between the way like scholars thought about uh, the Asian peace, which is really an East Asian and Pacific peace, and the way that Washington policy folks and like mainstream security studies thought about basically the same uh, phenomenon. And this is circa. 2010, 2012, right? So for the better part of a decade, I sat with that gap, um, just like marinating on it between theory and practice, uh, you know, before I started writing the book. And the way the book started out, to be honest, you know, it wasn't going to reconcile this gap between like Washington and Asian peace scholars. The book was initially supposed to be a critique of Trump, uh, as a unique threat to the Asian piece. So the story, you know, that I, I set out to write initially was going to be that like, okay, after a century and a half of recurring interstate wars and mass casualty violence, the period starting in 1979 has been remarkably stable. You know, mass casualty violence in Asia has dropped dramatically since then. There have been no new interstate wars since that, right? And there were very obvious ways that Trump's foreign policy was putting all that at risk. But then I started writing the book, doing the research. And what really jarred me was that there was nothing unique in Trump's approach to Asia um, when you start diving deep into US, the history of like US relations with Asia since the 70s. So, you know, I'm going back over uh, the old national security memos and speeches and strategy documents and, you know, what did Asian governments think of us at the time, all that stuff, right? Especially during the Reagan era. And none of the things that we clutched our pearls about during the Trump years was unprecedented. All of it had antecedents. Like Trump was, I mean, he's stylistically unusual, weird, whatever. Um, but his policies were just heightened versions of like pre-existing habits of, of militarism and domination in our foreign policy that were already there. He wasn't so deviant, right? He was a difference of degree rather than kind. And coming to terms with that uh, forced me to revisit this gap that I saw so long ago, right? Between the factors that scholars widely understood to be responsible for the Asian peace, uh, and then the factors that Washington sort of took for granted, which is basically them. Um, and so the book is kind of dealing with all that. Uh, it's trying to do an honest, critical reckoning with America's share in causing, uh, if you will, the Asian peace. Why? Because it's an outcome that we like, it's normatively desirable, the Asian peace is arguably a global public good. Uh, and so I set out to explain America's relationship to this empirical puzzle we call the Asian peace. But to explain that, we have to also explain the various factors that account for the Asian peace, right? Um, and so that leads 
to the book making three interlinked arguments. Um, just briefly, one is that the Asian piece is a layered piece, which is to say there's no single source of the piece, and it's it's the result of multiple converging factors in in, in time, right? And in that sense, the Asian piece has been overdetermined for a while. There's strong evidence uh, that U.S. alliances and general deterrence uh, from U.S. forward posture have sometimes, and I have to stress sometimes, played a positive role in Asian stability. Um, but more pervasive in importance um, has been economic interdependence and Sino-U.S. cooperation. Those have been major factors in stabilizing the region. And there have been secondary factors too that have buttressed the Asian peace and made it even deeper than simply the absence of interstate wars, more like security communities, right? Um, in different times and places within Asia. So the Asian piece is a layered piece. Uh, it's bigger than any one factor, any one actor. And then my second argument, which follows logically from that, is what is, is that what I call the Pacific power paradox is a much more accurate narrative about America's role in Asia and in, in the Pacific since 1979 than the story that Washington tells about itself, about its own role, right? So like Hillary Clinton, um, when she was Secretary of State, she, she announced the pivot to Asia in Foreign Policy magazine. And then she famously said, you know, Asia is eager for our leadership and our business. We've underwritten regional security for decades because of our irreplaceable role in the Pacific. And that is the prevailing view in DC. That was what I was fed growing up. That is what most Biden administration people probably believe. And it is just not correct, right? That's American exceptionalism, which is a pathology that reflects a, a bad, incomplete understanding of history. And bad history is a bad basis on which to do strategy and statecraft. So the second argument is that Washington's narrative about itself in Asia is, is dangerously wrong, right? And then my third argument is that Asian security today is far more brittle than it's been in the past generation. And the reason has partly to do with US choices. So the Asian piece is very much at risk today once you understand what the sources of this piece are, have been. So you look at the sources of the Asian piece, deterrence and alliances, right? Great power detente, uh, economic interdependence within the region, regionalism, multilateralism, habits of consensual diplomacy, right? And then even democratization to some degree, which does certain doesn't apply to most of Asia, but there are pockets, right? These are these things are a useful scorecard for understanding when US choices are taking risks against the Asian peace. I mean, any government really can use this as a kind of scorecard, right? And the things that cause peace, it changes depending on context, right? So deterrence, yeah, like I show in the book, sometimes it's a source of stability and sometimes it's the exact opposite. Sometimes it's a threat to stability. Um, um, so you don't want to be dogmatic with this stuff, but you do want to be like self-conscious, critically self-aware. You want to avoid blind spots, right? Um, and so the Asian piece, as I set it up, is kind of a framework for thinking holistically about risk and strategy in this region. Um, the controversy of the book, if I'm just putting it out there, is that this entire analysis allows that America is not always a beneficent exceptionalist power. And that is just hard for some people to swallow. You know, 10 years ago, that would have been impossible for me to swallow. But it's important, not just because it's true, um, but because it's a more stabilizing basis for, for America's posture toward Asia, right? The best, most stable orientation toward the Asian peace starts with recognizing what I call the Pacific power paradox, which is the historical reality that America has been Asia's aloof hegemon, its vital bulwark sometimes, and just as often its imperious superpower. So historically, America has been Asia's arsonist and firefighter, paradoxically. Um, yeah, and that's, that, that's the, the gist of the book, I guess. Okay, so now let's um, talk about that. You you said that you know there's layers of reasons or factors 
that contributed to the Asian peace uh, since 1970. So let's talk about that US-China detente, that cooperation component that you argue in the book has contributed, that has been a crucial component of uh, why we've had this uh, peace and stability in the region since 1970s. Um, well, you also say and trace back the shift that has happened in US approach uh, to the Obama administration. Uh, which uh, the years that uh, you spent time during, uh, in that administration as well. So what's your take on why this shift happened and how it has sort of progressed then from the Obama administration to the Trump administration and now into the Biden White House? Yeah, I mean, there wasn't any one thing. So the the impulse to com- quote unquote compete with China or to like foment a rivalry with China, that you saw evidence of that bubbling up in the George W. Bush administration, right? It's just that it got hijacked. It got subordinated or put on the back burner by the war on terror and the attacks on 9-11. But before 9-11 happened, you had Bush's national security advisor, Condoleezza Rice, writing in foreign affairs that um, I I I think Bush called China a strategic competitor. Like he actually used the phrase, uh, on the campaign trail, Condoleezza Rice was like arguing for uh, a foreign policy that was oriented toward great powers, which is like Russia and China, you know. And the neocon project in the 1990s that they were building while Bill Clinton was president, and then those neocons went into the Bush administration, that project was all oriented toward nation states and great powers and military primacy. And so, like, that was the footing that U.S. foreign policy was already on. Um, But neocons are also neoliberals. Neoliberals are all about that globalization. And so in a a twisted way, there were like a lot of incentives by like the economic side of the Bush administration to uh, maintain a strong strategic relationship with China, to maintain the cooperative framework of relations. Um, And that that those guys that set the economic neoliberals, they kind of won out because of 9-11, because focusing on the war on terror made China more of a partner or an adversary. And that 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 is what like was pushing the great power stuff onto the back burner um, until the Obama years. And in the Obama years, it was uh, uh, China as, as a necessary ally or partner in maintaining global financial stability. And then from there, it was uh, trying to balance Chinese power, contain Chinese military power within an overall framework of cooperation. And as uh, the Biden, uh, the Obama administration was ending, they, the Pentagon in particular was using a lot of like great power competition language as the default. Military primacy was the default. And so we were sliding into rivalry. And at that point, that's when Trump comes in. And so Trump's people, you know, they're or they're all in on China rivalry and they've got support from like the national security state and the like sort of liberal establishment that supported Obama for the most part. And, you know, now Biden is outbidding Trump on all of this stuff. Um, And it's sort of run away with us like we. We slid into rivalry without questioning our premises too strongly. Um, and so that's where all this comes from. That's where the shift comes from in my mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, Van, in part of your book, you say that America's margin for geopolitical error is smaller now than ever before. Uh, mm-hmm. Can you explain why that is the case? Is it because of the rivalry uh, with Beijing? Uh, so in the unipolar moment, the US could uh, disrupt Asian regionalism. It could push Asia toward a major financial crisis. It could invade Iraq, right? Those are geopolitical errors, but they they didn't dethrone the U.S., right? In the current context, power the, the power balance has shifted, right? Asian political economy has shifted. Um, a lot of American foreign policy people are not they're not cognizant of the of the true fact that like. America is on the periphery of Asian, of the structure of Asian political economy, and China is at the center. And that is by design, by the choices of smaller states and by American choices, American design. Like we kind of put China at the center of Asian political economy. 
And we chose, I mean, not the executive branch, but we chose to do things like not join certain regional architectures. You know, the TPP comes to mind, but there's many aspects of like the structure of Asian economics that like kind of displaces us. And that is a, a reality that did not exist 20, 25 years ago, right? Um, and so material reality has changed in such a way that, oh, and the factors that upheld the Asian piece, this is like crucial to the book, the things that have kept Asia stable for the past 44 years, they're eroding. They're eroding in real time. They're eroding partly as a result of our choices, right? So in our current historical conjuncture, policy blunders are much more likely to lead to like not just war, but to America kind of dethroning itself, like further discrediting notions of a rules-based order. Um, and the, 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 the way of things, the structure of things in the unipolar moment, uh, there was more margin for error. And this entire current generation of policymakers in Washington, of which, I mean, I was a part of this, right? They are used to operating in a world where if we screw up, somebody else has to eat that cost. We don't eat that cost, and we also don't really have to worry about great power wars. Those two things are no longer true. Um, and so that's what I kind of mean, like there's less margin for error um, if we make big blunders. And arguably, I think this whole economic containment thing that we're doing with China now is the start of a big blunder. It's not going to be cost free, not just for the rest of the world, but for us either. Mm -hmm. Um, we're going to talk more about the containment um, policy for sure. But um, in another part of the book, I think it's actually in the final uh, chapter, if I remember correctly, you argue against uh, American military superiority um, in, in Asia and say, if we aim for military preeminence, uh, that creates more imbalance in the region, which is not going to be sustainable. Uh, but in Washington, many argue that unless the uh, United States keeps its military superiority, it will not be able to deter Beijing from taking course of action, such as an attack on Taiwan, for example. So my question for you, Van, is without having superior military capabilities to deter Beijing in the Taiwan Strait or in the South or East China Seas, how do you want to uh, deter more aggressive Chinese actions? Yeah, so this is where we have to own up to the fact that Washington is not omnipotent and what they're saying doesn't make any damn sense, right? Like the way that you phrase that question is, I think, an accurate representation of Washington's view, which is like, well, military primacy deters and deterring China is precisely what we need to prevent an invasion. What that what that phrasing and framing misses or what it makes, what, what exposes itself as being wrong is like, China is actively deterred on an ongoing basis from invading Taiwan. And we have a favorable balance of power basically everywhere in the world except the Taiwan Strait. And the bizarre reality is that the balance of power in the Taiwan Strait is not something we can actually have be favorable to us anymore, no matter what we do. When we use the Taiwan Strait as the metric for saying we want military superiority, what we're doing because of the, the geography of it, because all of Taiwan falls within China's um, integrated air defense range, right? Uh, we have such massive disadvantages in that space that unless we're gonna fight World War III, in which case everybody loses, right? The winner loses too. Unless we're gonna do that, it's a geography where we cannot win or have a favorable balance of power in the traditional sense. So if China is actively deterred from invading Taiwan, and we know that that's true because there ain't no invasion happening right now, and we don't want to fight World War III, and we have a favorable balance of power everywhere except that one place, and in that one place, it's not possible to achieve military superiority without World War III, then what are we talking about? We're talking about people in Washington using the Taiwan impossible standard to do what C. Wright Mills called the idiot's race, right? We're talking about pure militarism. We're talking about an unlimited blank check for the Pentagon, which is why 
even Biden's defense budgets are bigger than even Trump's defense budgets, which were bigger than even Obama's defense budgets. And it just keeps on going. It keeps on going because this is a rigged game. It's not defining Taiwan as the standard for military superiority means that we will pour all of your resources and tax money and everybody's resources and tax money until the end of time into more missiles and nukes until it all just explodes. There is no winning this, you know? So it's a farce. The, the, if, if deterrence is what you seek, deterrence is what you've already achieved. You have to do nothing extra. This is, this is the observed reality, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I want to challenge some of your arguments, uh, Van, by bringing up uh, opinion of other uh, American thinkers. Um, in your book and a recent article you wrote in Foreign Affairs, you say that current US policy towards China is a policy of uh, containment in everything but its name. Uh, mm. And then you argue against uh, containment and say that it will undermine uh, peace and stability in Asia, as you have said um, here as well. Uh, well, many American experts and thinkers these, day are, uh, these days argue that containment, in fact, should be the US uh, strategy to roll back a China that's more belligerent and assertive on the world stage. And it's not only the Washington foreign policy establishment saying this. Uh, even uh, realist thinkers such as uh, Mersheimer, um, who is considered a restrainer when it comes to his views, for example, uh, on engagement of the United States in the Middle East, or even with respect to Ukraine-Russia war, he says that U.S. detente with China during these past decades was wrong and allowed China to grow rapidly. And he concludes that, you know, and, and I quote him here, driving force behind the U.S.-China rivalry is structural and cannot be eliminated with policymaking. So basically, he claims that the rivalry is here to stay. And the best we can do is to set some guardrails to ensure that it doesn't turn into a hot war. What do you say in response to this argument? Mm. Uh, I mean, so... Mearsheimer thinks that the U.S. needs to lead an anti-hegemonic coalition because in his world, only great powers matter. And so if it's not us, it's another great power, right? If we're not dominating, someone else is going to dominate. Like, that's just his worldview. But that isn't true. That's also not true of the Asian experience, right? Asia is very large, very diverse, very unconquerable. And, and we have a huge margin of advantage, like I said, in the balance of power, basically globally, just but like definitely not in the Taiwan Strait. And that matters, all this matters for the foreseeable future because, you know, there will always be organic resistance to Chinese hegemony. And so we don't have that much to worry about. And if we're seriously abiding by the balance of power, we have a large margin for restraint and we should be using it to try and shape a better, more just, more stable order, not, not doubling down on US primacy. Um, I mean, two other things about Mearsheimer on, on China too. One, if you believe that rivalry and war is inevitable, then there's nothing to argue. Like you can't be reasoned with. It's, it's an assumption that means your your policy advocacy is going to be unmoved no matter what you know but most people are not of that view because it's unreasonable and our fate is what we make it you know terminator john connor but two um, china experts themselves debate whether china seeks regional hegemony and what regional hegemony uh, is supposed to like look like in the event that it were to be something china seeks so China seeks greater status. Um, with greater power comes greater status seeking. That's like normal and expected, but that's not the same thing as hegemony, right? Well, if if China seeks hegemony, is that true? Depends what you mean, you know. Um, like too often, there's a fuzzy, menacing red image that we call Chinese hegemony that we invoke when we want to scare people into supporting militarism, things that investments that would otherwise be not rational for a democracy to make, you know, uh, China cannot dominate Asia, but whether it even seeks hegemony, which is not necessarily domination, depends on what you have in mind by the term. So uh, Mearsheimer's claims 
they're based on assumptions that are clearer than truth, right? He's explicit about his assumptions, you know, but but they're dubious. They're not well founded. And he's viewing China through a psychologically comforting meta narrative, right? Not through China's or Asia's history. And that's not a knock on realism. That's a knock on like his particular strand of it because it is very meta-narrative based and the realist tradition is very capacious and diverse actually. Um, and so the, the version that he's tapping into when he makes these arguments is not well-founded. It is very meta-narrative. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about um, another, uh, another expert, another thinker. Robert Kagan recently uh, published uh, an essay uh, in the Wall Street Journal um, in which he argues, and it's kind of related to uh, what you mentioned about, for example, Taiwan uh, and U.S. approach to Taiwan as well. He argues that it is wrong for China to think that American strength is uh, waning and that it will be able to dominate Asia. He says that if China tries something like attacking Taiwan, and I quote him, Xi is likely to join Vladimir Putin, uh, the Soviets and the Axis leaders of the Second World War in bringing a tragedy upon his people and the world. Um, so my understanding, Van, is that Robert Kagan in that piece uh, and others who think like him in a way say that it is up to China whether we can keep Asia peaceful or not. If, if they try to coerce their neighbors and dominate the region, and there might be some disagreements between you and him, for example, on this, because you say that maybe uh, that, that in some aspects, maybe China is not looking for it. Regional for regional hegemony, then U.S. and uh, and its allies will challenge China. So their point of view is that if they try to coerce their neighbors and dominate the region, uh, U.S. and its allies will challenge China, uh, even if they have to militarily. So what do you think about this argument? Isn't it up to Beijing whether the competition remains peaceful or not in Asia? I mean, international relations. This sounds stupidly true. Is relational. And if you accept that that's the case, there is never a situation where everything is up to what one side decides. Everything's interactive, everything's mutual, everything is relational and contingent, you know? And so the frame, you, you can tell right away that this is all a bunch of BS analytically because the frame is like, well, it's up to China. No, it's not. What are you talking about? What is that? What do you, why are you saying that? The reason you're saying that is because you want military primacy, right? And I'll be honest, I'm not here to throw shade at any individual human, but I make it a habit not to take seriously people who were cheerleaders for the freaking Iraq war, right? The ultimate sign of horrendous judgment. Um, but like, if we're going to take this seriously, the Kagan thing, there are two problems with the at least two problems with the way Kagan is viewing China and this argument that he's structuring. One, Chinese perceptions of U.S. decline are not about U.S. strength. It's not about U.S. military power. That is false, right? Perceptions of decline have to do with legitimacy and authority, which the U.S. erodes by being a revisionist to the order that it claims to defend. Hagen wants the debate to be about strength. He wants it to be about military power because then more military power becomes the soothing answer, right? But he's misrepresenting both China and what's meant by U.S. decline, you know? And then two, the way Kagan advocates for primacy totally sidesteps, it totally masks a plausible theory of stability. Like, you think the People's Liberation Army doesn't know that it risks eating American bombs if it invades Taiwan? Like, that's been priced in since the 90s. You know, the question Kagan is dodging in this, like, rhetorical construction that he's devised is the question of, like, what's most likely to ensure stability across the Taiwan Strait? And if that's the question, there cannot be a, a more ridiculous answer as a theory of stability than arms racing. And arms racing is what, what the preservation of primacy demands. So surprise, the guy who thinks Iraq was a good idea also thinks war with China will fix what ails America. This is a sick joke. You know, what version of the multiverse am I in that this is like being taken seriously as an argument? 
Mm -hmm. um, ben, let me ask you about the perspective of uh, other uh, regional countries about the US approach, US grant strategy, uh, current strategy towards uh, Asia. Um, you know, on one hand, we have uh, Philippines, Japan, they are strengthening their military cooperation with US. We've had uh, recent news about uh, new access given to the United States Army uh, to uh, new bases in, in Philippines. Um, mm -hmm. On the other hand, we have perhaps uh, Indonesia, Singapore, ASEAN, who uh, seem to be more hesitant in terms of, you know, uh, being in uh, this binary of choosing between uh, China or the United States. So in your opinion, what is, uh, what's their perspective, especially on, on the policy of U.S. on Taiwan, how worried they are, and, and what do you think their approach uh, will be moving forward? Yeah, I mean, most Asian states and most Pacific states, they, they're up, they're basically outright refusing this frame of like choosing China or choosing the United States. And one of the reasons for that is they're bending over backwards too in order to make sure that they're hedging, that they're engaging both equally, that they're distancing from each, each other equally. Uh, they're trying to bridge the two when possible. The reason why they're doing all that is because like, it doesn't matter if you choose China or choose the United States. In either, in either case, you are choosing to heighten rivalry. You're abetting um, a process of interaction that is like worse for everybody that like erodes regional security right it 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 eats away at the very foundations of the asian peace which have to do with like regional cohesion and interdependence you know and so they're trying to like create and imagine their own version of regional order that eschews or or um is an alternative to like this guy's the hegemon or this guy's the hegemon you know, and as long as they're contesting that that's hegemony, then it's a bad day for all the secondary states. So Japan is Japan and Australia are um, a little odd or deviant in this respect. But for most Asian countries, because they're like firmly in the U.S. camp and they're happy to be um, aligned with the U.S., even if the price is heightening rivalry, that's not the case so much for South Korea it's definitely not the case for any of the ASEAN countries or the Pacific nations. Um, and so they're, they're looking at the region from the perspective of like, well, how do we uh, situate ourselves in this emerging rivalry so that we can maximally push back on it and re preserve our autonomy? And if that's what the smaller states in the region are doing, we should be trying to take cues from that and like adapt to that, you know? Because not only do they have a better sense of what it's going to take to preserve stability in their region, because it's their region, but also like we we're more likely to have influence and to cut off Chinese influence if we can be seen as supporting their way of doing things, what they want, right? Um, and that's very counter to the idea of like forging geoeconomic blocks that cut off the lifeblood of their economies, which is is China. Mm -hmm. uh, so my understanding from your book, uh, Van, um, and, and your writings elsewhere as well, is that you acknowledge the threats from China. It's not like you mm. say that there is no threats coming from China. So please tell me, what's your recipe for dealing with a more assertive China? What do you think U.S. grand strategy, and you get into this and explain this and elaborate in your book, uh, but what do you think U.S. grand strategy should look like towards Asia and in particular towards China to preserve uh, a peaceful uh, and stable Asia? Yeah, that's a good question. Almost, Sorry, before yeah. you answer that, Van, I just want to encourage our audience here on Zoom, if you have questions, please submit it in the Q&A box and I'll try to cover as many of your questions as well. Thank you. Go ahead. Sure. Sure. Um, Oh, wait, shit, I'm sorry, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> so it's about what, what's your recipe for U.S. grand strategy? What do you think it should uh, look uh, like uh, to, to be able to uh, to preserve uh, peace in, in Asia, and especially towards China that, you know, I'm sure you also believe and, and acknowledge that there are threats emanating from China that needs to be checked? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm 
I mean, I worked in the Pentagon, right? Like I'm very far from uh, naive about the, the problems that China poses. Um, I'm just also not naive about the global distribution of power and the ways in which we have particular advantages and particular disadvantages. Um, so like, I think I'm clear right about power in a way that people in DC kind of are romantically not. Um, and that affects this big question that you're asking about like, well, what, what ultimately do maybe do we do or do differently? And so there are two dimensions of that. Um, there's like a security dimension and a political economy dimension. The security dimension is that um, across the Taiwan Strait specifically, I view the situation as basically a security dilemma. And we know we this is what like security studies has basically existed to do. We know how to manage and ameliorate security dilemmas. If you've identified one, the best policy path is not sticks and coercion and arms racing. That's the path to an avoidable tragedy, right? The path is carrots, forms of reassurance, consistently signaling um, restraint, compromise, trying to establish an equilibrium, communicating in word and deed that you have defensive intentions, that you're security seeking, right? Um, and so that's a, a huge cleavage or like a huge unacknowledged problem is that like the best analysis of the Taiwan Strait is that we're in a security dilemma. And to the extent that that's true, it's hard to argue against that. And to the extent it's true, the policy prescription follows that it's carrots over sticks, right? And that's the part that DC hasn't come around to yet. Um, so that's how you like manage that part. And that necessarily means that you don't have to do 1.7 trillion dollars of nuclear modernization. It means you don't have to do these like hyper ambitious military force posture expansion projects that we're doing in the Biden years. It means that you don't have to do military superiority. You could do any strategy other than primacy, any strategy other than primacy, and it'd probably produce more stabilizing outcomes than the path that we're currently on, you know. Um, but uh, security is not going to come from like adjustments that we make to the defense budget, security is going to come from uh, changing how we do political economy uh, in Asia, possibly globally, in order to reduce the space for China to have a more belligerent foreign policy. It's like, we're worried about the Belt and Road Initiative. We're worried about everything China does, right? But the Belt and Road Initiative, it, its use of like development aid, the the sort of like somewhat um, not real debt trap diplomacy thing, right? All of China's economic heft, its weight, its influence, it that's capitalized by the capture of excess profits from um, manufacturing, squeezing laborers in China, right? So there's an extreme domestic imbalances in China's economy. And it involves a kind of oligarchy that uh, allows uh, manufacturers, owners of capital to take surplus value from its workers by suppressing worker rights, by suppressing labor rights, and then paying them garbage wages, basically repressing labor, and then using that as its advantage in the global economy taking those profits and then instead of redistributing them to workers, offshoring them. Where? Well, a little bit into like US real estate and uh, into US financial instruments, but also into all of these different projects that it uses in its uh, foreign policy that we're so worried about, like Belt and Road. Like, where does that money come from? What well, comes from capturing surplus value from repressed workers, right? And why are other countries in, in the developing world in particular, why are they receptive to Chinese capital, Chinese aid, even when we know that it, it can come with um, certain contingencies that maybe we don't like involving Chinese influence? Well, uh, they developing countries need this because they're starved of capital, right? They have they have debt sustainability problems. They they're trying to, they're they're eating, they're they're on the like losing side of the US Federal Reserve managing inflation, right? US Federal Reserve raising interest rates and it messes with their currency and their economies. 
It's like the plus pandemic recovery, plus the developing world disproportionately eats the climate crisis, right? The effects of it. So in a lot of ways, they need capital. China's offering it, right? So if we could change how we do political economy so that developing countries don't need to rely so much on Chinese capital, we would be doing ourselves and the world a huge favor. We would also, by doing that, we would also be encouraging Chinese oligarchs to not offshore so much capital, and that that makes the money available for redistribution. I mean, Xi Jinping has basically said he wants to increase domestic consumption, right? As he sees that as some kind of future for China's economy, and increasing domestic consumption in China is important. That matters. Under the current conditions of like oligarchic political economy, it's not possible. The only way that increased domestic consumption is going to happen is if workers get paid more, is if there's better redistribution within China. Well, how do you do that? Well, you do that by not offshoring so much of this surplus capital, right? And if we do that, we're mad, we're helping ameliorate the imbalances in China's economy that fuel ethno-nationalism in China, which in turn creates a more aggressive foreign policy from China. So if we can do political economy in like a more just and egalitarian way, think strategically about how it connects back to security, we can stabilize Asia and make the situation better in China at the same time. And then in parallel with all of that, if we're managing the Taiwan Strait as a security dilemma, and pursuing a more restrained foreign policy, then we're winning on that side too. So success looks like looks like stability. Um, and we're not on that path now, but it's conceivable how we can get there. And it, it just doesn't involve rivalry. It involves a lot of other things besides. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a couple of questions from our audience members that I want to ask you. Here's a question from Zachary Pakin, uh, our research fellow at IPD. Um, you talked about, as uh, Van, you talked about Taiwan and that uh, basically China is actively deterred already in terms of uh, intending to attack uh, Taiwan. But let me read his question. I've seen Van argue elsewhere that a Chinese invasion of Taiwan is highly unlikely. Um, you pointed to that here as well. Uh, could he please unpack in greater detail why he believes that to be the case? Is it just because of deterrence related factor or is there more at play than that? Yeah, I mean, so like general deterrence is not necessarily making active threats, right? That would be immediate deterrence. General deterrence is more like, it sounds silly, but it's true. It's like kind of vibes based or like the fuzzy abstract calculation, like, oh, it's going to be really costly if we do something. So therefore we don't do it. That's kind of how general deterrence works. And that is, that is what's holding, right? Like, the PLA and the CCP, they know, they know that uh, if they try to use military force to take or attack Taiwan, it's going to be extremely costly, right? And the, the oligarchs in China and the CCP in China, obviously, they support a more belligerent foreign policy up to a point, but it's going to ruin their day if if China ends up in a, a war where their fates are unclear, but also where China ends up on the receiving end of like a pretty robust sanctions regime, you know? Um, so to have a sort of belligerent foreign policy is not the same thing. Like Wolf Warrior, some guy talking crap on Twitter um, is not the same thing as like a willingness to invade or to like look to launch a large scale invasion, you know? And in this respect, I think Putin's blunder in with with Ukraine is very uh, illust illustrative or like confirming of the reality that if China takes military action against Taiwan and the moral clarity shows that they're in the wrong, that they're the bad guy, because like sometimes there's a fog of war and like the, if China's going to do something militarily, it makes the most sense for them to do it under conditions of like moral ambiguity, you know? Um, but if it's just morally clear that like they're the aggressor, it's obvious that the world is gonna respond in an extremely unfavorable way, even separate from what the US does militarily, you know? And so that 
that is too costly to undertake. Um, and that means that China is actively deterred, you know? And you don't actually need to rely on deterrence to prevent an invasion most of the time, you know? We, there was no risk of China invading Taiwan in the 80s or throughout the early 1990s, right? There was no risk of it. And we weren't relying on deterrence, we were relying on detente, you know? And so if you have a, a cooperative relationship with like a, a positive valence, then um, you can foreclose on deterrence. In this current framework or the current mindset we're in, we seem to forget that or like not recognize that. But deterrence, like if you're having to rely on deterrence, you're already acknowledging that you've, you have failed in statecraft in some way, you know, um, and you're just trying to make the best of a bad situation, but you don't need to just stay there. And since China is actively generally deterred to begin with, the premise should be, what can we do to maximize the stability of the situation? And that's where the book comes in because it's like, well, that depends on how you understand the sources of stability. And that's why it's important to understand the history, right? Because that tells us what the sources of stability have been. Um, so it all comes back to Pacific Power Paradox. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Van. Um, another question uh, from, from our audience. This is about sort of the connection of, if, uh, if we look at the human rights violations that are happening in China, then uh, you know there is this argument that then we can draw a conclusion about how uh, China, uh, what, what are China's aims on international stage. Um, so let me ask the question as it is written here, does Van believe that CCP's treatment of uh, Falun Gong, and this person is referring only to Falun Gong, but we can say about Uyghurs and other minorities, um, and ethnic minorities are not an indicator of the regime's evil nature um, which is also capable to use force to further its hegemony at um, at uh, at its convenience. Yeah, I mean, China's got an abominable human rights record, right? I mean, that's my my biggest um, adversarial like perception of China is that it's just deeply anti democratic. The 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 regime that governs China is deeply anti democratic, and so you see evidence of that in its mass human rights violations, right? But that is totally analytically separate from whether China is a revisionist for um, like the questions of territorial conquest, you know? That the, 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 we don't think that Saudi Arabia is going to conquer the Middle East because it chops off journalists' heads, right? We don't, that, that's a ridiculous thing to say. It's a separate analytical claim that you have to make. So you can find the CCP's human rights violations abhorrent, and you can insist on coming up with ways to improve that. But there's no story that you can tell where spending more on defense or deploying military forces is going to improve China's human rights situation. That's not going to improve the situation for Uyghurs, right? Um, and so, like, the, and it's not beefing up deterrence or whatever in the Taiwan Strait is not analytically connected to China's human rights violations in Xinjiang. So uh, we have to we have to be like analytically clear about these relationships and also where there are not relationships causally. Okay, thank you. And uh, my last, my final question for you, uh, Van is about the role of other countries, US allies and uh, partners uh, with respect to you know, preserving uh, peace and stability in the region. What role do you think US allies can, can play, whether we talk about Japan or South Korea or Five Eyes allies? You're based in New Zealand, we're based in Canada, so Canada, uh, New Zealand, uh, United Kingdom, Australia. Given mm -hmm. this tension and rivalry between uh, US and China that's unlikely to go away anytime soon, what role do you think they can play in maintaining uh, peace and stability in Asia? Yeah, that's a very good question. So the crazy thing is that even U.S. interests are not fully aligned with U.S. primacy, uh, let alone the interests of allies. Um, like 
we're on a, a bad path by even our own, own standards, I think. Um, for allies, I think that the US approach of primacy puts them in a bad position. So, you know, when you see like Japan, Australia, South Korea as kind of like the big three allies, if you will, they're spending more on defense. Um, we're facilitating their defense modernization, their military buildups. So we're proliferating to them. We sh There's a couple of solutions here. We can do that and not do primacy and then rely on these frontline states to be the, the key balancers in Asian security, in which case we don't need to play such a role ourselves. We can just facilitate them doing that. Or we can pursue primacy where we try to maintain military superiority, but that helps stability because it's buying our allies out of having to arms race themselves. They're not having to do military modernization. They're not having to play that balancing game so much, right? What we're doing right now is kind of the worst of both worlds. So like we're arming allies to the teeth and we're pursuing military primacy ourselves. And we're doing a military force posture in Asia that's like, it, we, we, it used to be that we were not encircling China, but China used to say that we were encircling China. Now we're actually doing that with our force posture, right? And allies are also facilitating that. So having allies is generally a good thing. Being an ally of the US, whether it's a good thing or not, depends on situation. But the, the best way for allies to play a kind of stabilizing role here is to recognize that rivalry is in nobody's interest. Ending the Asian peace is in nobody's interest. The formation of rivalry blocks makes everybody less secure. Rivalries are bad for democracy, generally, bad for stability even. Um, and so there's a lot of value in encouraging America to turn toward a restraint posture and to support that, you know? Um, and part of that may be um, proliferating weapons to allies a bit. Um, restraint doesn't look like any one thing, um, but that's really the best hope for stability. And then secondarily, recognize the new non-aligned movement, right? There's a lot of energy of smaller states to avoid this rivalry formation stuff. Um, and if US allies turn away and neglect uh, the non-aligned block, that movement is gonna be susceptible to Chinese co-optation. So like security will come from allies encouraging US restraint, I think, and or looking to bolster regionalism and uh, the global South, what we used to call the third world, you know. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you, Van, for this great conversation. A lot to think about. Uh, and thank you for offering, you know, alternative views that we usually uh, don't hear a, a lot uh, from, from um, you know, mainstream channels, if I want to call it that. Um, mm -hmm. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. You can find the link to order Van's book uh, here in the chat box. So make sure you go to that link, check it out, order his book and uh, read the uh, full book to get all uh, the good points that he has there. Uh, and also, if you want to access the recording of this conversation, please go to our YouTube channel uh, for the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy, and the recording will be available right after this talk. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks a Thank lot. You. Thank you, Van, again for your time. And Thank see you. you. All soon. Great. Take care. Right. Thank you.